I have good news and bad news. I'll start with the good one. You, me, everyone in this room, we will make history as the first generation to collectively die of climate change. That was also the bad news, by the way. So, how do you feel about that? I'm a journalist, and making people feel terrified is just a part of the deal. My name is Didam Tali, and in the past several years, I've had the good fortune of reporting about human rights around the world. I'm not the bravest, and at the end of each project, I always go back to my sweet middle-class privileges. But I also heard so many awful stories. In Myanmar, I talked to young women who were sold into human trafficking, or I met Syrian families who had to leave their homes on a cold night with nothing but their clothes on their backs. And in Cambodia, I met farmers who lost their legs after stepping on a landmine. I am absolutely honored that these people are opening up to me about the most difficult moments of their lives, and I cannot even imagine what they must be going through. But as I kept hearing all these stories, something piled up within me, and I started to feel crushing anger and anxiety and hopelessness and guilt. I was terrified about our future, and in my worst days, I couldn't leave my bed or my flat. It turns out that I'm far from alone experiencing these symptoms when um, you're facing constant loop of negativity, and there is a name for what I went through. It's called secondary trauma or compassion fatigue. The logic is secondhand smoking would harm your lungs, so secondhand trauma harms our mental health. I've experienced this because of my job, but one of the many ways to feel this is the overexposure to constant loop of negativity. Anger and anxiety are important feelings, so I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't feel these, but the way that I see it, if a large and conscious group of people like yourselves feel these symptoms that I described to the point of emotional shutdown, I don't see how it's productive to anyone. Yet, it's really hard to regulate these emotions. The challenge today is no previous generation in history had access to information like we do. The homo smartphonicus. <laughs> I took this uh, photo a couple of years ago when I was living in Cambodia, and it might not be too clear from the photo, but there are three Buddhist monks in a shopping mall hunched on their mobile phones like this and playing Candy Crush Saga. <laughs> Honestly, if this is the case of the terrain Buddhist monks, it's a pretty rough challenge for the rest of us. From an evolutionary perspective, we need to be aware of the threats around us, and this is how journalism and storytelling started. These 20,000-year-old cave paintings from southern France could probably be interpreted as a headline. Danger, aggressive animals seen roaming around. Imagine this, a gatherer goes out of her cave and sees a tiger with sharp, sharp teeth, and she drops everything, runs for her life, and goes back to her cave, and maybe draws the tiger on the wall of the cave. And when these are happening, her body is releasing all sorts of hormones, like stress and adrenaline and dopamine. But for us, for the homo smartphonicus, we might have very comfortable lives away from these immediate threats like tigers, but unfortunately, our brains and hormones are exactly the same as our ancestors. So, the crucial difference is the Homo smartphonicus consumes 34 gigabytes of information every day, when our ancestors probably see a tiger once a day, maybe once a week. So, for us, the sharp teeth of the tiger are everywhere. It's the unattended Amazon fires, school shootings, wars, famines, radicalization, climate catastrophe, pollution, microplastics, just you name it. Wherever you look, anything that can pose a potential threat to us and our global communities is the sharp tiger's teeth. So, we have a catch-22. 
The tiger's teeth are everywhere and it's harming us, but we also need to be aware of the threats to progress as humanity. So how do we find this sweet middle ground when, where we are responsible citizens, but protect our mental health? I believe the answer lies in diversifying our media diet. Imagine eating fiery hot chilies every day for every meal. No matter how much you like spicy food, you would upset your stomach and be in pain at some point. And the news media works exactly like this. The sharp tiger's teeth are bruising us. But most cuisines in the world will have a tradition to consume something creamy to balance out the hot spicy food like drinking a glass of lassi or eating some sour cream. And back in home in Turkey, we have this yogurt drink called Iran, so if I eat something spicy, you might see me like this, gulping one down. So what's the cream in journalism to balance out the hot chilies and give you this post-Iran glow? This is not escapist content, celebrity news, or taking a quiz to figure out what Game of Thrones character you are. There is nothing inherently wrong with any of these, obviously, apart from the fact that you give all your data for free to find out that you're Hodor, but let's not get into that for now. The way that I see it, all the news in the world happen on a spectrum. Say the unattended Amazon fires are on the left side of the spectrum, whereas the cure to cancer is on the right side. But the truth is, most things actually happen in this middle zone, and we don't hear enough stories about that middle zone. And these stories from the gray zone aren't necessarily praising governments or sugarcoating terrible things that are happening, but these are the stories of resilience and hope and possibilities, and the way that communities are around the world are dealing with the things that they have to go through. Of course, we absolutely need the heart-hitting investigations or the watchdogs to expose the wrongdoings, but that's not the whole picture. And when I say the whole picture, this is what I mean. A whole story acknowledges a problem, addresses the response to a problem, explores how it works, offers insight, includes limitations, and shows evidence of impact. A couple of years ago, I traveled to Mongolia to report on the world's most terrible case of air pollution. The smoke was so thick that people sometimes had traffic accidents because they couldn't even see each other. It was absolutely terrifying. But then, on a different day, I met Ulzi. Ulzi worked in uh, South Korea for a long time as a construction worker, and when he had enough, he went back to Mongolia. But one day, he saw something that really upset him. A few children in his community were playing in this ditch that was just filled with rubbish, and he thought they deserved better, so he tapped into his own skills in construction. He cleaned tons and tons of rubbish and built this beautiful park for the children instead. Similarly, in Myanmar, I talked to these human trafficking survivors, the young women whose backs you're seeing, they were sold into human trafficking by their own mother, and they had harrowing stories to tell me. But on a different day, I met a group of puppetry artists. These women ran a mobile theater, and they took the magic of the puppets to rural villages. Through their performances, they educated kids about human trafficking and the risks, so puppet shows gave the kids potentially life-saving information. What I love most about these kinds of stories is that they show us that there is human dignity and creativity in every situation, and I believe that these nuanced stories of resilience are the cream in journalism to not just to help us to stay sane, but to also learn how we can fix our world. Luckily, it's not just the big media giants that can reach hundreds and millions of people, and these young people from the Congolese capital of Kinshasa know exactly what I'm talking about. As homeless teenagers, they suffered from intense stigma, but a local charity helped them to produce their own radio program, so the communities tuned in, then their perception about these children changed, and it was a win-win situation for everyone. 
Things are changing and a lot of media outlets are opening to these nuanced narratives and ideas, but also the internet is growing at a perplexing rate and the access to these kinds of stories can still be a challenge and it is why I'm working on a new project. In this platform called the Sanity Feed, I'll be curating the kind of stories to diversify the media diet and feed a nuanced worldview. And if you're aware of any stories that fit the bill, please do let me know because acknowledging progress or other good things doesn't mean we are endorsing the bad things. In contrast, it ignites change. When I was working in Cambodia, I came across a group of women who were working as landmine cleaners in the north of the country. The woman you see has been doing this job for 25 years and her name is Kutya. One day, I caught up with her and we stood on the world's most heavily landmine soil and there are still 10 million landmines in the area. And she shook her head and told me, our jobs are nowhere near done yet. But Kutya and her colleagues risk their lives every day to serve their communities, and thanks to their brave work, thousands of more people can now live without fear. From our mythologies to popular culture, we are obsessed with stories of power and destruction. We love a good villain story, which is why we keep handing the microphone to the aggressive men with guns, the corrupt politicians, the drug lords, or people who are famous for no other reason than being famous. And let's face it, whenever we hand the microphone to these people, in a way we are endorsing them a little bit. But we don't hear enough about people like Kutya and Ulzi, and I think that is a shame. So, I invite you to think. We probably heard of the bad guys who planted those landmines there in the first place, but how about we heard more about the people, ordinary people, who are trying to rise up their circumstances? What if we talked more about them instead and championed and endorsed their work by making them a part of our global debate? Don't wait to diversify your media diet, not just to stay sane, but to learn how we can fix our world. We all have unique gifts to contribute to this process of fixing our world, and like Ulzi, Kutya, or millions of other people whose names we don't know yet, our jobs are nowhere near done yet either. Thank you very much.